Kia ora and welcome to Cinema in Context, where we discuss all things film and the connections between. My name is Jeremy Downing. I'm William Chan. And I'm Sarah Watt. And each month at Cinema in Context, we discuss two films, one current and one retrospective with some connection. It could be the same director, the same actor, or a similar theme. This month, we are discussing Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald, which came out this month, and Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, which came out way back in 2004. The connection being that they are both part of the Wizarding World franchise, <laughs> J.K. Rowling's behemoth saga of wizards, witches, and magic. So, William, do you want to give us a bit of an overview of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban? Of course. So, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban was directed by Alfonso Cuaron, um, and it was kind of the, the first in this new wave of Harry Potter films where everything was slightly moodier, slightly darker, less franchisey. Um, and it basically was the film that set the tone for the rest of the Potter franchise from this point onwards. So the story uh, involves Harry in his third year, they're, he and his friends are 13 year olds, and they're navigating both school and also the ghosts of the past. It involves a lot of cool stuff, a lot of um, bits of adventure and daring do, and some time travel aspects at the end, which is really, really exciting. Excellent. And Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald is the second film in this this new series, this prequel series, uh, which is building up to the famed Dumbledore versus Grindelwald fight, uh, which we know from the Harry Potter series as being a big part of Dumbledore's legacy. Um, and this plot is, is very uh, convoluted. <laughs> There's a lot going on. But ultimately, it's a story of Grindelwald trying to rally his supporters and our lead uh, character, Newt Scamander, who's got an affinity towards fantastic creatures uh, and his team of people kind of trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I think that's as, 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 best, as much as I've got for this one. <laughs> and we can unpack this. I think before we get into it, I just want to say that a special shout out to Craig, one of our regular listeners who requested this pairing. Um, so happy to, uh, to take suggestions. And this is, I think, our first Proper suggestion, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yep. Yeah, so thank you, Craig. We hope you enjoy this discussion. Um, knowing you and knowing that you, uh, knowing your thoughts about the film, I think you're going to find this a thrilling discussion, mm-hmm. to say the least. Um, and also just a, a warning, as always, that we will be spoilering both films. We'll be talking about uh, you know key aspects of both films. So if you don't want either of these films spoiled and you haven't seen them yet, please go and watch them and then come back and visit this podcast at a later date. Right. Wizarding World, go. That logo, it, it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I like how the wands kind of open up and it's kind of a book as well. Um, and that's the second thing the, the second thing you see in the movie, um, well, the what's called Fantastic Beasts, mm. where instead of Warner Brothers, you go through and, oh gosh, we're now in franchise land. Mm. And that is, I, I think, exciting, but also a little concerning. Like, this is firmly in the realm of superhero movies now mm. I mean that's that's what they want they want a, some sort of evergreen thing where entries can come in and make a lot of money every single time you know there's that that consistency there and I think it's built as well into their theme parks mm-hmm. and their their merchandise mm. and their, their websites and it is huge mm. I mean it is a money making machine mm-hmm. I mean it's great though to see that JK Rowling for oh I'm sure all the criticisms we're going to be bringing her way um, but it's great to see her so actively involved in these films I mean she is the screenwriter mm-hmm. um, and she seems to have her, her finger in most of the, the projects that are happening around the Harry Potter universe. Can I ask you, um, I, I haven't read, um, full disclaimer, I haven't read um, a single Harry Potter book. And I, a Fantastic Beast books before their films or no? No, this is the original stories that right. have not been books So before. in the books, um, because as I was re-watching The Prisoner of Azkaban, I thought to myself, gosh, I wonder if this is exactly how it was in, in the book. And I wonder that you, we, you've foreshadowed already, Jeremy, that Fantastic Beasts has quite a confusing plot. And given that she is the screenwriter, are the books of the Harry Potter series very jump back and forthy and very, very detailed and then shh, we're off somewhere else and all that? Or are they easier to follow? They're, they're much easier to follow. They, they follow Harry. Yeah. Most of the time. There are a few instances where a chapter at the start of the book might be with a different character, particularly as you get to the later books. Um, key villains might be introduced or... And then fleshed out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, it's usually like a prologue, and then yeah. it jumps to Harry and it stays with mm-hmm. Harry the whole time. Um, and I think that's... that's I, I think with this Fantastic Beasts film, to kind mm-hmm. of, I'll come back and answer your question a bit more, 
I think they're trying to figure out what type of stories they are. Mm. Like, there's a lot going on. And even in the first one, there was a lot going on. Um, whereas the Harry Potter films and stories are much more structured. And they're much mm. more character-driven. Mm. I mean, again, I don't know anything other than what I see. But um, I don't really know anything very much about Newt Scamander. Um, other than what we're shown on screen. And I'm, I, I appreciate there probably is backstory that I've missed. And I, believe it or not, did see the other Fantastic Beasts film. But nothing's happening for me that's drawing me into the characters. And one of my biggest criticisms of this recent Fantastic Beasts is there's this purported sort of um, thwarted love between him and Catherine Waterston's character. Mm. And she's hardly in it at all mm. and does absolutely nothing and fe- and show, portrays absolutely nothing. And therefore, I think, well, if that's going to be your your emotional sort of thrust that we're meant to be following to make it not just a superhero mm. movie, then where is that? Whereas watching these 13-year-olds running around and now knowing that, spoilers, apparently, because I haven't read anything, but I know that <laughs> Hermione goes off and marries Ron. It's really interesting when you watch now the third film in the... Mm-hmm. In the mm-hmm. There were eight, ultimately, weren't there? Because mm-hmm. they split the last two. That you think, I can see that this was planned all along, mm, that Harry yeah. was only ever going to be the BFF, and that Ron, with this Beatrice and Benedict sort of much ado about <laughs> nothing-ish kind of ne-ne-ne, the whole time, mm. it's a big given. Whereas mm. I think when I saw it back in 2004, I didn't know anything. I, didn't, I wasn't really thinking about, is she going to wind up marrying one or other? And know? Caron brings that in in this film, obviously, for the first mm. time, whereas um, Rowling doesn't hint at that until probably book five, I think. Oh, it that's interesting. Or book four. I think book four it starts to be hinted at, that... Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that's brought in much earlier. But did he make this film in 2004 before she had written the, written the, the, the source material book, where they get book married? Book four had come out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so all the first four books had come out uh, by the time the first film was made. Mm-hmm. And then the fifth book came out uh, before this film was made. So the, the five books had been made at this point. So in the fifth book, it's hinted that Hermione and Ron will, turn, will, will end up together. Yeah. So that's yeah. A, a logical step for Quaron to take. And also, Rowling was involved in the screenwriting process of all right. the films. So, so she, she was might have feeding... tapped her nose and said, oh, why don't we have a little more bickering <laughs> well, between let's, these two? Well, talking about that, you know, when they made the sixth film, there was this um, line in the script where Dumbledore says to Harry, oh, I remember my love, she was blah, blah, blah. And that's when Rowling was like, um, hang, hang on, no, 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 that's not going to be in there because Dumbledore's gay. And it was like the big... Well, what you know, this is right. not part of the story. Which there was some criticisms. It's like, why bring this up and it's not part of the story? Or mm-hmm. if you're going to bring it up, put it in the story. Right. And yeah. I take my hat off to them because it was it was clearly a part of this new story. Mm-hmm. Um, his love for Grindelwald. Well, and I, I hope it's going to be more a part of this new story. <clears throat> well, it is because they're kind of that spell that, that binds them together is a central MacGuffin, isn't it? Mm, that's right. The oh. um oh, that, that that little thing. <laughs> Completely forgot about it. It's just so... Okay, yeah. so back to your thing as well. Like, you've got the story of... I, I do feel like the, the four... Well, Newt Scamander is central to the story, but the other three characters from the first film are, are just pretty much redundant. Even the Queenie and... and um, Jacob. Jacob's story yeah. is weird. I don't yeah. know why she goes off with him. It doesn't make no sense to me that she goes off with Grindelwald. I think it's just for... Oh, I don't know about that. But it's... No, it doesn't make... That because she make wants to marry a, a, a nomad, and yeah. then she's going off with this guy that supposedly... Wants, wants to, to subjugate nomads. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was strange But to maybe me. she's been inveigled by him. Wow, it's not clear though, is it? Well, no, none of it's clear. As far as I had <laughs> a little map, it was I, so I, unclear, to be honest. Anyway, I, feel like, I feel like the heart of the story is should be the L- Bellatrix L- Lestrange. L- Lestrange. L- Lestrange. Yeah. Lestrange story. But that's confusing. She's sort of on the side, and then mm-hmm. she's like, I, I, you know, I said in my review that um, she gave a, Zoe Kravitz gave a wonderful performance in that role, but she just doesn't really have much to do. You've got the Credence MacGuffin going on, which is just. Who knows what to think about the Dumbledore reveal at the end? I don't mm. know if that's true or what's going on. Mm. Got... Apparently, um, the people have said that it is true. It's not a lie. Oh, it's just um, so confusing. <laughs> so it makes no way. You're talking about um, Ezra Miller's character. Yeah, whether he's Dumbledore or not. A Dumbledore. It, it's, I mean, like, I think Ezra Miller was woefully underused. Yeah. I think he's a stunning actor, and, mm. I, and I enjoy him in absolutely everything. And he didn't really seem to have anything to do, and he was hardly in it, and, and I didn't really understand. Yeah. I, I literally thought he was dead at the end of the last so, movie. So did I. Because he blew up. Yeah. 
<laughs> you shouldn't fall for that one, William. We've seen enough movies where people walk out of the flames. Oh, post-credits. no body, man. No body, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I would have really appreciated some some person with one line. It's like I thought we were dead. Or no, I they did. They oh, started the film. They said oh. I thought he was dead. Oh, okay. yeah, they did <laughs> say that, and I was like, all right, well, I'll, <laughs> right. I'll take it. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, it's, going, it's, yes. it's um, it's it's a film trying to find its its narrative. Mm. It's got a lot of plot, but a limited, or it's got just too much narrative going on. With no, you know, at least in that in Azkaban, you've got a really clear yes. drive, yes. an emotional drive. Harry is dealing with with the fear of fear, and he's yeah. learning about. I mean, it's a wonderful scene at the end when the three friends of his father all kind of interact for the first time, and mm-hmm. you know, you got Peter Pettigrew and um, Sirius Black and um, Lupin, mm-hmm. played by. I mean, this is the caliber of cast. Yes, in that's yeah. what I was <laughs> Timothy Spall comes out and I'm like oh my goodness and then you've got Alan Rickman in there you've got four as you say incredibly high caliber actors yeah yeah. Um, in a Harry Potter movie yeah I mean the whole cast you know. and then Emma, Emma Watson's in there yeah and Emma, Emma Thompson Emma, Emma, sorry Emma Thompson yeah. Emma Watson's there too Maggie <laughs> Smith is fleetingly in there and obviously yeah. we know that she goes on to be in it but no particularly those four I yeah. thought mm. my goodness these men mm. of the stage many of them are waving wands around and taking it yeah. absolutely seriously did you know, notice that Julie Christie's in there too yes I, that's mm-hmm. something I didn't pick up for years because yeah. she's in such a sort of sidelined role <laughs> shout out to Julie Christie of course who was in Don't Look Now and today we found out that Nick Rugg, um the director of Don't Look Now passed away That's overnight right. age oh, 90 oh. so there's a very uh, con- contemporary uh, connection yeah. but anyway yeah. so yeah extraordinary cast by comparison Fantastic Beasts not so much. Well, I, I will say I really enjoyed Jude Law and John mm. Depp. I, I think mm. they, they gave really compelling performances. I agree. Mm. Regardless of the story around them or mm. what they were, the material they were given. Well, they committed. Yeah, especially Johnny Depp. Like he, he. Did, I mean, you know, Johnny Depp is he's basically a parody of himself now. Um, I read a review that called him a, a one man costume party, which is pretty great. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. what hat is he going to put on this <laughs> yeah. time? Um, but he took the role completely seriously which mm. is what you needed and like you can't have a twinkle in your eye with this but role. he always does and mm-hmm. I mean you know say what you like about him and you know people very close to me didn't want to see that film because they've gone off Johnny Depp considerably because of his personal life yeah. but I I still think he is one of the preeminent actors of our age mm-hmm. and I think absolutely for his commitment he will do any genre any uh, sort of you know level of film including was it The Tourist that he did mm. with Angelina Jolie <laughs> which was utter garbage but he's absolutely committed. You're mm-hmm. right. You never get the sense that he's just faxing in his performance yeah. to buy a condo. Mm. And I read a very interesting Vanity Fair article that suggests that he is um, in financial straits and probably ought to be doing more mm. films for, to mm. finance condos. But he gives it everything. I was That was the biggest thing that I was uh, concerned about. Oh, and also the fact that the previous characters from the last film, I couldn't figure out how they would fit in mm. with this movie, and I was right to be concerned about that. But I mean, we had talked about before this podcast how the introduction of Johnny Depp in the last film seems so redundant. Yeah, but Colin I, Farrell was fine, thank you very much. What yeah. are you doing? But I take that back now because I think that Johnny Depp's, he was so subdued, yeah. mm. he was so seductive. Like, mm. I think Grindelwald needs to have an air of sexuality to, mm-hmm. to kind of, to pay off the story points of mm. why Dumbledore kind of uh, is, is sort of in this complicated situation with him. Mm. And, and I think Johnny Depp, he is the master of over the top, mm. but this was not over the top. Mm. And I fully agree with you, William, it, it, both Jude Law and Johnny Depp mm. and Eddie Red- Redmayne. I mean, mm. Eddie Redmayne's as a hero, mm. he's he's like no other. He's, he's not an anti-hero, but he's not. Mm. He's just he's he's wonderful. The unwilling. Uh, the reluctant the hero. The reluctant hero. But yeah. he's awkward and he's 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 great. He's a uh, really great hero. I, I felt a little tired of his stick by the end I of it. did. It was, um, I mean, he was, uh, my, my problem with Eddie Redmayne is his performance here is really one note. And yeah. it's, uh, I don't know, uh, from my point of view, it's, uh, there's only so much you can take of the, um, uh, yes, um. And the head down. Uh, yes. The, I'm and going the, the, to the look at you shoulders. from under my fringe. <laughs> um, yeah. He's, he's, exactly, the head down, he has one way of push, positioning his body through the entire movie. Yeah. Kind of like the little, the little cocked uh, chin. Yeah. Um, and it was really funny to see all these women falling for him throughout the entire movie. Yeah. Um, and it was <laughs> just that, that, that whole persona and the demeanor I found a little annoying by the end of it. I, Fair enough. Yeah, I have to say I, I agree with I agree with William. I, I, I hear you, Jeremy, in that initially, great, this is fresh, this is interesting, as you say, it's a sort of an anti-heroic sort of hero. But yeah, then eventually... Mm. 
Yeah, I had to keep thinking. Oh, but wait, I've seen you in other films where you're totally different, so I like, know that like you're Jupiter Ascending. No, oh, I was thinking that as well. Oh, 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 but, uh, oh my word! I still enjoyed that more than Guardians of the Galaxy. So that's saying a lot about my feelings in Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> my feelings about Fantastic Beasts, the second one is the only thing that I remotely enjoy about it is the world building. Mm. And unfortunately, Mm. even then, it suffers for me from being the second because the first Mm. film was astonishing for the world building and I absolutely Mm. loved it. And so this time, definitely my my, my eyes are going, well, we've seen this world before to a large extent, you know. Um, And also, William and I saw it in a screening where the projection was... Um, overwhelmingly dark and we don't know whether that was a mistake in the projection or not like I get that it's a dark film and you William Mm -hmm. have already said that um, Alfonso Cuaron started to make the film uh, from the third the Azkaban film that they had a darker sort of tinge and Mm -hmm. then of course David what not David Yates Yates took over didn't he so Mm -hmm. carried that on so I get that there's some synchronicity there but ours did feel very very dark and muddy a lot of times and not necessarily intentionally Mm -hmm. so so that could have been a projection issue but unfortunately because uh, uh, Jeremy like yeah I I saw I I read your review online and you praising the opening action scene Mm. Um, Sarah and I were we had no idea what was going on oh Um, wow because it was just boop 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 boop, boop. and then particle effects with the rain and it was just really hard to see what was going on yeah Oh, wow. yeah. So I, I was with my, my brother and one of my sisters, and we all agreed that that was a wonderful opening sequence. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe it was to do with the darkness, because I could see what was going on. It was intense mm-hmm. at parts, but yeah. on a whole, I knew what was happening. Mm-hmm. No, that was a real shame. Yeah. So the world building... The animals, the creatures. See, oh, I, oh, but you see, I, I don't care them. about animals. So oh, okay. well, I, I don't like even it. know why I went to this film, ah, other than ah, the fact ah, that you said I should. Ah, I got to go for free. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's really nothing in it that enchants me. No, not, um, not even the big cat dragon with its definitely, oh. definitely not the big cat dragon oh, <laughs> like dust and yeah. no not even like if so anything lovely. the <laughs> only time my little heart my little <laughs> cold heart <on> my <laughs> thudded a little was when they went to Hogwarts oh yeah and as I say I'm not a massive the whole, fan the whole audience went, <gasps> exactly and at least I'm like Oh, I get this. I, for a moment here, I, I, I'm, I'm in. I, I, this is familiar to me, and it feels nice. Mm-hmm. And I enjoyed her going around and having a look and lifting the desk and blah blah mm. blah. And that was that was that was that felt nice. But it did also make me wish that they were just going to go to Hogwarts and do a, a Hogwarts movie. Well, I mean, on the note of Hogwarts, I think um, the third Harry Potter film, Azkaban. One of the things I really like what it did. And some people, some purists would be like, no. But they gave creative, uh, creative reign to, to Alfonso Cuaron. He redesigned, mm. he changed locations. So if you oh. watch the first two films, like The Whomping Willow, for instance, for instance, is in a different position. Um, certain aspects of the grounds, just like Hagrid's hut, just completely changes. Yeah. It's all on a, a huge slope now. Yeah, it's really yeah. cool. Very sort of oh. Scottish. And... Mm-hmm. I can see that being annoying for purists. Yeah, <laughs> but it's wonderful because it's so much better. And it, and it fits the, the, the function of the story. Yeah. All of the time metaphors... Just going through the clock mm. is just so cool. The going back in time part was mind blowing the first time in two thousand four, and it was mind blowing this week when I rewatched it. The, I thought it was stunning. Mm. The editing was so good. So mm. good. And I remember. Oh, 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 oh,
Christopher Columbus did it, or Chris Columbus, whatever yeah. it was, did a great job of, of creating the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he did a great job with the child actors, and he did a great job of, of uh, kind of bringing that to life. Establishing the context. Mm. But yeah. a lot of it is quite sort of carbon copy yes. of the books, yeah. and it loses some of the tension. Yeah. Yeah. And that third film was like, you know what, we can take key pieces. Yeah. And they leave off some really key pieces, like, for instance, the map, you know, the map mm-hmm. that he has, mm-hmm. that is created by his four the four friends, his father and his yeah. three friends. Mm. So it's actually a really key plot point in the story. It connects it all together mm. that this map and Lupin says, I don't know how you got this. So they, they created it together. But of course, it's not relevant in the, the yeah. film for that story. No, man, that annoyed me so much when I watched it. I know, time. same too. Uh, but I actually you have, understand why though, right? I have in my notes, Marauder's map, question mark? Yeah. Patronus charm, question mark? Mm. Um, watching it a second time, I, I do think the movie would have gained something if they included that stuff in. Um, with how... You know, the Patronus takes the form of the stag, and that that's his dad's, and he thinks his dad is around. True, I realized that that wasn't included yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and none of that is, is explained. You have to you have to read the book. I mean, mm. even reading around the lines is a little tricky. Mm. Um, but yeah, because his, his, his dad's four friends, I mean, they play such a central part to the entire story. Mm. And I just felt like there was just a missing connection with the Marauders map. Mm. Yeah. But I, th- I, I hear you, but I think that's something you gain from reading the book, because otherwise... Mm. If you go too far in that direction, you end up with Fantastic Beasts too, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that um, J.K. Rowling, she's she's doing. I mean, she's a novel writer that's that's writing screenplays, um, and I do think that with the Harry Potter films, she was involved in the screenwriting process, but there was a screenwriter to come in and craft a story. Yeah. And I think that she needs a second opinion in the, the, the Fantastic Beasts film. Mm-hmm. I do think her dialogue is translating really well, mm-hmm. and she's writing actually some really lovely scenes in Fantastic Beasts. It's just a matter of tidying it up and, and in particular I just came off reading her latest novel Lethal White which she's written under her pseudonym Robert Galbraith mm-hmm. and that's a that's Robert a, a Robert Galbraith oh so she's written as a man yeah mm. um, that's a wonderfully um, woven th- mystery thread of madness that all comes mm-hmm. out in the end cool. mm. and it's because she can control the, the delivery of information mm. but when you're making a film as a screenwriter you can't control how it's going to be interpreted and mm. all the iterations or how are it's going to edited happen. ultimately mm. and where the scenes are cut out sure so it needed it needed some stuff taken out of that movie mm. I mean for me the icing on the cake of that movie is Nicholas Flamel which of course is fan service mm. for the, the, he, so created, he created the, the Philosopher's Stone, the incredibly old man with the kind of breaking hands. That, that we thought well, was Matthew film? Modine. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, oh, in <laughs> Fantastic, Fantastic Beasts, Beasts. Beasts. Right. So he right. created the Philosopher's Stone of the first Harry Potter book. And, oh, there's, right. and there's even a scene where he goes into a cupboard and the Philosopher's Stone yeah. glowing in the background. Oh, that's nice. If you know. Yes, and but he doesn't need to be there. He's mm. just an additional character that's but, just... I mean, you know, that's, bless him, may, may he rest in peace, but that's having a Stan Lee moment in every film, isn't it? Doesn't I suppose. need to be there, but it's kind of like gives you that... Woo, yeah, but when Flamel comes in at the end, man, guys, can we can we talk about the ending of Fantastic? Yeah, let's do it. Um, uh, is this the bit that I had a nap through? Yes, yes, it yeah. is. Apparently, uh, it was really meaningful, <laughs> political. There was like illusion. Um, the, the, I'm the like, final oh. the final half hour of the movie <laughs> was such a roller coaster of emotions for me. It starts with possibly the worst thing in the movie, where the um, sorry, I can't remember his name, the Senegalese wizard. Um, the guy who's kind of the, who Catherine Watterson is chasing, and uh, oh yes, the, yes. the octopus that gets the, 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 the does kind of, yeah, the octopus. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm, my fear of octopus is well and truly established, <laughs> and the fact of having one in the eye is like, oh my gosh, this is amazingly <laughs> terrifying. But, but yeah, he's he's the brother of Little yeah, Strange, maybe. I don't, but but so so basically, all our main characters are gathered in a crypt, in a crypt, yes, yes. and um and there's just it's a parlor scene, okay, and he has this. It feels like it's 10 minutes long, probably shorter, but it feels yeah. forever. Mm. This huge flashback about, yes, my family and the strangers and this and that and that. And then you're like, oh, this is pretty boring. And that's when my and sister <laughs> turned to me and she's like, Are you fo- I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> it's hard to follow that scene. But then Zoe Kravitz, oh, he comes out of this flashback, like, and Zoe Kravitz says, hang on. That's not what happens. And goes on her 10-minute spiel about, oh, my gosh. And then she finishes. And, and Jacob, bless his heart, has no idea what's going on. And he turns around, and there's a doorway behind him. and says, Queenie, honey, are you behind here? And scene end. What the? Yeah. yeah. The editing is so, like, slapdash. It is just, it's exposition, exposition dump. Yeah. I don't think it's um, editing. I think it's writing. Okay. Like, I do think it's writing. I think that that's, this film is in dire need of a narrative, a mm-hmm. single narrative to, to, to tether us to the plot. And yeah. that feels so um, like carefully woven mm. 
but just so much exposition in one moment yeah. and kind of in in conflict to the kind of Grindelwald story that mm-hmm. it's like we yeah. need, you need some work here yeah. team it's it's and it's that's messy. maybe that's why I don't know because I don't understand any of it but maybe that's why the revelation at the end of Ezra Miller's possible provenance or whatever feels a bit tacked on totally mm. it's like well, oh wait what and now huh yeah <laughs> oh. totally look I'm fully in agreement with everything you guys are saying I gave the film four stars because visually I did love it I did love the animals I loved pretty much all the performances and I feel like this film this series could produce a brilliant film like all of the thematic pieces are there all of the allusions to politics are there I feel like the 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 mythology the production design is amazing and David Yates for you know I think the issues are with the script because the directing I I feel was like the just everything felt really considered and Yeah, but so well what placed. are they going to do? They're not going to say to JK next time, okay, look, um, how much can we pay you to not write the next they need, one? They need a partner who with a screenwriter. They need to yeah. do the George Lucas in the prequel and the, and the, the first three Star Wars films. And, uh, or, <laughs> they need or, an editor. or they need to get a director who isn't as... I mean, I, I feel that David Yates is reasonably pedestrian and... And does an okay job, but you know, maybe they need somebody mm. a bit more visionary mm. who, who can also you take know, on board the who has co written his own scripts yeah. and mm. therefore can craft a bit of a story. Because, do, do you guys remember um, Order of the Phoenix when David Yates first came on? It was mm. really exciting, and mm. he was using this newspaper thing for montages. Yeah. Mm. It's just like, wow, this is new and fresh and mm. really, really cool and really trimmed. Like, yeah. the whole the story when that book is, <laughs> is neat and well needed of an edit, that mm. fifth book is, is a tome. But yeah, he, he did. He really trimmed it back to its its bare essentials. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, well, to continue on with the, the finale, uh, we then enter Johnny Depp's Trump stash Hitler rally. Yeah. Um, and it was a, I thought it was a pretty cool scene. Um, it was weird making allusions to World War II. I don't mm. quite know what to think about that. Mm. Um, and I, I've seen some opinions online. It's like, wait, was Grindelwald going to like prevent the Holocaust and the nuclear bombs. Like that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I mean, then we end up with the real finale, which is a firefight in the sky. And I just completely switched off. I was mm. like, Nope, this is not what I want. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I asked, I asked Sarah afterwards, why did, why did the red, dragons fight the blue dragon was like, like how did the blue fire dragons get defeated by red fire and just and then Nicholas Flamel was there like as a main part of it and I had no idea why. Mm. Um and why why don't the magic cops just all apparate when they're in trouble and instead go, ah oh, and get toasted? Why does Leda Lestrange sacrifice herself when she had like an owl backstory just flying away in the wind? Mm. <laughs> I yeah did not did not enjoy this movie. Mm. You bring up you bring up great points. I fully agree. Okay, let's talk about um, Azkaban a bit more because that film. Can I, I ask you? Feel as well. Gary Oldman, structured. yeah, that was yes. the first mm-hmm. one that Gary Oldman turned up in. Yes, right. And to me, that was one of the thrills: is when is he coming? When's he coming? When's he coming? And I and I like the whole. You know, in in hindsight, it seems dumb, but I do like the whole. Oh, he's an evil man. Oh, mm-hmm. he's your godfather. Oh, this is all going to be very bad. And I love the moving posters. I remember in two thousand four, that mm-hmm. felt really innovative and cool. But then it takes ages for Gary Oldman or for Sirius to turn up. Mm-hmm. And then when Sirius turns up, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels as though. It's a very short period of time before him turning up and then it turning out, no, no, I'm your mate. Don't worry about mm. it. We're all friends here. And I wondered and whether... And Harry's like, I want to live with you. Yeah, right. yeah. So I, and Because it all seemed to happen, it was well after an yeah. hour and 15 minutes into it. And so I wonder, you know, I don't want to teach JK her job. I don't want to tell her how to write. But I wonder whether she could have maybe... Um, given them a bit more time and opportunity to really build up the whole terror of he's right here and whatever he's doing is sinister and mis- misunderstood and misinterpreted before you have the revelation of, no, no, I'm yeah. actually a good person. But that seemed to be gone pretty quickly. Yeah. So then he's in subsequent films, obviously, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He becomes a key part of the story. I mean, in the books, there are more uh, interactions, mysterious interactions. So Harry's given a gift. Right. He's given the broom halfway through the film. We don't right. know who it's from. Um, so there's little interactions that you're like, oh, someone's, he's got a little guardian angel going on. And so right. by the time that you find out that Sirius is all good and he's been the one that's been been the guardian angel, it's sort of like, it, it fits into place. So it doesn't right. feel as jarring. Yeah. Yeah. Not a big criticism though. And I do think Gary Oldman was stunning. I think David Thewlis is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. What a great choice for Lupin. No, Not what I expected when I was like, a kid. reading it. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, although, I mean, 
having since seen some of his work, especially in Fargo, it's really hard to go back to. It's like, yeah, this is a good guy. Yeah, I forgot he's in Fargo. He plays one of the most horrific characters, doesn't he? <laughs> With those teeth, man. Oh, those teeth. Yuck. I oh, first yuck, saw yuck. him in a Mike Lee. I think it was a Mike Lee film called mm-hmm. Naked, which is really horrible and uh-huh. really misanthropic, and he's mm. he's very evil and horrible in it. Um, and so for me, seeing him as a nice character, I was a bit like, but is he? Yeah. I, I saw kept him like, dragging chocolate. Yeah, like. I, kept, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I kept expecting the reveal to be that he was the baddie uh, and that he had infiltrated Hogwarts and befriended which is, Harry. Which is playing and, off, she's playing off that expectation because yeah. the Dementia Against the Dark Arts teacher usually is the, the baddie. baddie they do that, don't they, with Alan, with, um, Alan Rickman's character and then he turns out to be nice. Am I right? That yeah, in the yeah. earlier films it's like, oh, he's... Probably yeah. Snape is probably evil, but then it turns out he's a goodie. They yeah. play with that through the whole series. Yeah, right. But um, I remember David Thewlis from was it Dragon Heart with Sean Connery? Yes, yeah. yeah. and he the plays the prince. prince. Yeah, right. that's what I remember him from. Um, uh, I mean, and then of course he's the secret baddie in Wonder Woman. Oh the, yes, the moment he shows up with that mustache, I turn to my brother's like, I think he's the baddie. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just look at that mustache. Yeah. Just look at it. Okay, well, um, what I want to talk about is the music in Harry Potter three because oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. it's the third and final John Williams score, mm-hmm. and he's such a master, and he knows how to use that theme, the mm-hmm. famous Harry Potter theme, which mm. they still play, they still trade off in um, at the beginning of Fantastic, Fantastic Beasts. Beasts. It is oh man, when that theme, Hedwig's theme starts, you're like oh my heart, I know, and then the rest of the film, <laughs> and then you go oh, and then all of the he's and then the additional music that he's written for this movie as well. Um, I think you mentioned a few weeks ago, William, about the old old medieval style yeah, instruments. and instruments. Using medieval instruments. You even see a student play a medieval fruit flute in it. It's, mm. it's really cool. A medieval fruit? That would be yeah. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> a chord. A chord. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, and just the choir yeah. scene. I mean, yeah. it doesn't need to yeah. be there, but it's wonderful. Oh, and, yes. And it gives the, the film such a different tone from the first two as well. Um, and from the fourth and from the fifth. This is yeah. the only one that does it. Mm. Um, and it's, it's absolutely wonderful. I, I agree, Jeremy. I think this is the best Harry Potter score out of all of them. Yeah. Every, every. I mean, the second one has some lovely additional themes. There mm-hmm. are some you know, some beautiful themes there. Um, and I do feel that the, the music takes a downturn in the in the next couple of films. It comes back again with Alexand- Alexandre de Splat. Yeah, yeah. It's a great for job. the final ones. Mm. Yeah, for the final two. But I, yeah, this is the pinnacle of, mm-hmm. of music. And mm. there's a scene where um, Harry's writing the hippogriff um, what's his name Buckbeak Mm -hmm. and it's just this beautiful sequence and the music just swells and it's it's quite a simple like it's it's just him going alright for this thing but of course it becomes much more Mm. important at the end of the Mm -hmm. film Mm. it's it's just wonderful yeah and it's only six notes that whole theme wow um, I, I, I do want to highlight, of course, the uh, Aunt Marge scene, yeah. where he basically takes Rossini's thieving magpie, yes. and creates his own like I don't know parody of it, and fits it all within like three minutes, and yeah. it's brilliant. And I love the Roald Dahl aspect of that mm-hmm. it's scene. It's deeply sinister. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how she just flies away, and you yeah. see her later on in, in the sky, like still screaming. <laughs> deeply sinister, also, because that Rossini, as you say, was mm-hmm. used in Clockwork Orange. Yes, and a yes. much, much more sinister. <laughs> Too. So it's quite horrible if you're like, oh, shit, where's he going with this? I thought, I have to say, I thought there was a lot of really dark, yeah. like, frightening stuff. The werewolf? Um, oh, no, actually, the, the dementors. Werewolf, the dementors, more than yeah. anything, with the yeah. face sucking thing, I mm-hmm. think is extraordinary, and but awful. There was a lot of really scary stuff in mm. the um, in the Azkaban movie that mm. I think, oh, I don't yeah. know how my, if I had children, I don't know how. There was criticism at the time for that as well. Mm. I mean, criticisms, I mean, you've just got to be aware that you're going to see what sort of film you're seeing. I mean, yeah. it's a children's film to a certain extent. You know, mm. you've got to be aware of of how dark it is you know the Dementors are, mm. are her embodiment of depression mm. and of course chocolate being the yeah. the, the saviour of depression <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's, a, it's a that's her thing and how she just struggled through that and she uh, needed to communicate to children about th- this force mm. of they reminded me of the ring wraiths mm. oh, yeah, which absolutely. I still think are the most frightening thing in any of the uh, Lord of the Rings they worked incredibly hard to uh, create the Dementors mm. in a way that you know, of course, you're going to make that connection, but they needed to make them differentiated. differentiated. Yeah. And so they they sort of uh, like in the books, the Dementors don't fly. Oh, um, they they just wander around. But um, oh, that's even probably worse. Yeah. That's scarier. Yeah. So the, the Dementors they they needed to make them more like a wisp of. Because I know Quaron originally wanted puppets, um, but it, oh, it was too expensive, didn't work for him, so they, mm. they went with CGI. He really wanted that quality of that that wispiness, the almost like ink and water. Mm. Oh, yeah. cool. 
Um, but man, that the the Quidditch scene I, I do want to bring up as well. Mm. What an amazing yes. sequence! Yes, um, and so different from the Quidditch scenes in one and two, which are very very you know bright, colourful, mm. and, yeah. and it's it's Harry and one of the other Seekers you know duking it out. Yeah. And in this, it's just survival against the elements. Yeah. Basically, mm. um, everything is dark silver there's lightning and then the clouds turn into the, like a horde of dementors mm. it's just it's so intense and it keeps amping up that intensity yeah, yeah. and it, has, it serves such a clear purpose for the story it's mm-hmm. not just a, a, a you know an aside of, of quidditch yeah which i know that jk rowling said was one of her biggest challenges writing the series was how can i work quidditch in here that feels fresh and interesting yeah. and she's like when the fourth book comes along she's like oh good the tribe was a tournament there's no quidditch happening this year <laughs> that was one of the biggest challenges was yeah. to make this made up sport interesting mm. but i agree with you and just the, the the kind of the goal I guess of of Quran to put this in, in <laughs> thunder and lightning and yeah whoa. I, I was thinking again as a teacher it's like would we allow games of rugby yeah. to be in a lightning storm mm, yeah not. And, and I loved as well the, yeah. I, was, I was watching it again obviously and and thinking uh, what is the umbrella There's, it starts with an umbrella oh, flying yeah. around and of course that's there to make us initially think that the Dementors are an umbrella. Mm. Like, it's just a little yeah. detail that Colin's yep. thrown in there, but it just helps. Ooh, is that an umbrella? No, it's a Dementor. <laughs> mm. it's, it's really great. Yeah. As an aside, it's funny you say about looking at it as a teacher, because I think it does change yeah. our view, yeah. doesn't it? Because there's a lot of things I'm like, is this appropriate? <laughs> Take your arm off your shoulder. <laughs> Shouldn't you open the classroom door? That's like, I was Where thinking the same. thing With Lupin? I was thinking oh, the same thing. <laughs> With Hagrid. You know, yes, even yeah, Hagrid yeah. says, I'm not supposed to have students in here. Or yeah. it's getting dark or something. He's like, no, you blooming well armed. And that's the first when I watched it. That's the first time I watched this film as a teacher, and mm. I thought the same thing. When Lupin's doing the lessons with him on the and doing, you know, the expected patronum, I'm thinking, oh, they're alone in a classroom together. This is not good. <laughs> and and at the same time, I'm thinking, and David Thewlis is obviously a bad character because yeah. he's David Thewlis. So therefore, this is only going to go really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Have some chocolate. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, dear. oh gosh, and it happens a lot through the Harry Potter series. Uh-huh. And as a as a kid, he doesn't even think of it. Yeah. Oh gosh, teacher. <laughs> this teacher is mean. Life. This is mean and judgmental, but I've started so I'll finish. Um, one thing I hate about the, um, well, just the 2004 film, is remembering how horribly everybody dressed in the 2000s. Because the young people are wearing the dowdiest, <laughs> the wrong colours. That pink is not right for Emma Thompson, <laughs> Emma, Emma Watson. The dowdiest <laughs> hoodies and boot, um, bootleg jeans and I sweaters. I, and I swear that Harry Potter's wearing those sort of, you know, those sneakers that aren't. They're, they're almost tramping boots. Um, <laughs> and I'm just like, you guys look really lame. Well, so that was something he introduced as well because in the previous films they never really wore. It was all uniform. It was all uniform. Yeah. But oh, then they changed so it up. Casual clothes. And yeah. I think the intent. I think it's because of the time travel aspect, so you can identify who is who. Oh, I yes. think it's very Clever. much in purpose. Oh, uh, nice. I don't think it's purposely bad. I think it's just no that's just 2000s yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the hair and it was embarrassing and the jump oh don't get me well I've started so anyway. <laughs> anyway apart from that though um, speaking of Harry shoes uh, I did love I, I completely forgot about the scene where um the, the monster book of monsters is under his bed and it's just mm. this, this practical effect and it's so mm. cute mm. There's, a lo- there's a few lovely yeah. things like that I love the moment when the cleaner goes past the door and goes yeah. housekeeping and mm. then the door opens and this sort of scream comes yeah. out it's very I'll come back later yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there's a sense of humour which again was an introduction to this film because yeah. I don't remember the first two films having that kind of and, and Dawn nature. French is the painting. Oh, yes. yes. I mean, yes. Hiding behind the hippo. What? Yeah. Fabulous. I mean, it, and, but even in the bit before that, where she's like trying to sing and crack the glass. I mean, oh, they're, they're delightful little moments. It's just a little, little, little skit, like in the yeah. middle of a Harry Potter movie. Yeah. And it works. And, and it she, totally works. Recast yeah. as well, because they had a different the different actor playing the, the fat lady. Mm. Later on. In the previous films. Oh, right. I don't yeah. think that she, the fat lady ever comes back into it. Mm. Or if she does, it's a different actor again. And, and also, you know, I really enjoyed things like Hermione turning up and Ron going, where did she come from? And mm. it's not mentioned. Nothing is followed through until later and then you realise why. Mm. And I really like those sorts of things where they sow a little seed and you're like, yeah, what's going on here? You know, I like that. And the books, the, the, the Harry Potter books in, in essence are mystery stories. Mm. They are. And she's a brilliant mystery writer. And I didn't feel like the first two films adequately captured that sense mm. of mystery. Mm. But you're right this film it has those pieces in there maybe a little bit more obvious than they are in the book but mm, it has mm, to be mm. to kind of have those points I mean all the things about the werewolf and things mm, it's, yeah. kind of, it's all there yeah well like lupine or lupine I mean lupine Lu- means yeah. of wolf, wolf right oh, so um, right. yeah so then when yeah so I thought wait a second did they all know 
know he's a werewolf or has that just happened? Because again, you see, if I'm watching the third one, I'm like, is there stuff I ought to know? Mm. Um, but yeah, in hindsight, it's a giveaway, isn't it? Can I say something that really didn't work for me? Um, in Azkaban? It, yeah, yeah. Draco Malfoy, I, I, I thought was terrible. He's uh, always a dick. <laughs> <laughs> but, but terribly acted and terribly written. I think he's, he's just... always terribly acted. Oh, really? Okay. I, honestly, I, like, I, I really met Tom character. Felton at Armageddon and he's really charming. He's really charismatic. Maybe it's just the writing. I don't know. Like mm. he, he makes him. Well, the movie makes him out to be such a cartoon. Yes. Where I, I, I'm pretty sure that's not the case for the majority of the kid characters. I mean, he's just like, oh, I'm gonna be the, the most outlandish bully, the coward, the, the, the you know, stop, the I'm a racist. I'm, yeah. rah, rah, rah. Oh, I'm so whiny. <laughs> um, all, all that stuff, and I, I don't think they pull it off. No. Mm. Um, I, I agree. I think he's poorly written, but I also don't think he's a very good actor. Let's just see okay. if he's done anything else. You may talk among yourselves. He's he's. I mean, he's a prop character, isn't he? He's there as he's there as their antagonist, yeah. isn't he? And he's, yeah. he's, he serves that purpose. <laughs> Um, well, he's an origin um, that's been advertised a lot nowadays. The TV show? Yeah, yeah. I remember him from Borrowers when I was a kid. He was a little boy in Borrowers oh, cool. with John Goodman. He was also in the um, uh, Plan of the Apes reboot. Yes. The guy who says, you know, get your damn dirty paws off me. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's not great, is it? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, they to be proud of. It's one of the cool things I do enjoy, though, from those Harry mm. Potter films is watching how the actors develop as the years go on. Mm. And some of them develop better than mm. others. Yeah. I mean, just watching Emma Watson, and she starts off in the first few films. And there's still a bit of it in this movie kind of overstating every step she yes. says oh my gosh and then she she kind of she develops into a wonderful actor by the end of the yeah. series and yeah. she's the one that's gone on to have the most successful career out of all this do you think so more yeah. than Daniel Radcliffe I do Daniel Radcliffe oh, he kind of frustrates me he's, he's, he's very experimental in, in what he chooses to he do. does a lot of um, yeah. quite way out theatre and things yeah, yeah. and then um, I mean Swiss Army Man was one of my favourite movies last year mm. it was last year or the year before yeah, but before she's done Beauty and the Beast yeah. she was in the Noah film which I know oh, that was appalling know. but she's done big projects yeah. I mean she did um, uh, what was her last thing that she did that was that was really she great she wasn't in that um, bling ring was she mm. uh, uh, she, she was oh, yeah. Yeah. Perks of Being a Wallflower yeah. with Ezra oh, yeah. Miller um, oh yeah, she was all right in that. Yeah. She um, was all right in that, but similar sort. Of, I no, I don't rate. I've never rated Emma Watson. To be oh, okay, fair enough. I think she does. She but does I got while she was cut. I got why she was cast as Hermione, mm. and then of course you know you find these three kids and you're stuck with them for the yeah. the eight films. So. Uh, it did not work for Ginny. Oh. So Ginny Weasley, who who is Ron's younger sister, who yeah. is eventually Mrs. Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, she is a wonderful character in the book for me. She's this feisty. She's kind mm. of got the, the the personality of her two twin brothers, but mm-hmm. with the kind of head on her shoulders to not piss everybody off. Mm. Um, and, and it makes sense. To, it makes sense why her and Harry would end up together. Mm. But the actor who plays her just just does not have that charisma. <laughs> She's so boring. <laughs> My gosh, I wish they'd recast her. Sorry, um, actor who plays the, the her. Body right, Bonnie. Yeah. yeah. Oh <laughs> See, it's look. You know, going back to Emma Watson, it's not her fault. If she was what ten or something when they cast her originally yeah. and they will have gone for somebody who over articulates like this and can come across the, as quite the, the, the annoying. Wingardium Liviosa trope. Like, yes. yes. <laughs> Wingardium Liviosa. And that she's going to be quite annoying but the yeah. problem is to me is that she's annoying all the time. So <laughs> she can't she she can't get the nuance. And, and as I say, but if you've cast this kid when they're ten, you're kind of stuck yeah. with you know. Mm. Well, you're, who was the Dumbledore before? Uh, Richard Harris. That's right? what I thought, yeah. and he died, right? Yeah. So that's why they so they. Michael Gambon. I do feel like Michael Gambon is miscast. He's he's wonderful when he does a good job with the role, but mm. he doesn't. I mean, a lot of people have commented on this as well. He's very sort of aggressive, yeah. and and of course he would. Michael Gambon would be aggressive, yeah. especially in the fourth movie. Yeah, when he throws, <laughs> yeah, when he throws Harry against the wall. But he's yeah. quite nice in this one. He's a bit yeah. soft with them. He's a bit like, well, I think you should do blah blah yeah. blah, and you know. And he, I do like him. He's he. I do like him uh, as a version of Dumbledore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but. Um, as he, yeah, he's, he's he's a bit different. I did really like Jude Law's um, interpretation, but of, again, of the Richard Harris Dumbledore, yeah, 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 he felt true. really similar to that, which is yeah, awesome. Yeah, and just his mannerisms and everything. Mm, it's hard though to make that connection yeah. because it's mm. so removed. I mean, what are we? Harry Potter is in the nineties. Fantastic Beasts is in 20s. the twenties. It's 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 a big jump, isn't mm, it? Yeah. Mm. Uh, and McGonagall being in Fantastic Beasts was a cool touch, but it makes mm. no sense. Mm. I saw people were like trying to figure out the timelines. Like she wasn't even born. Who plays her in Fantastic Beasts? I don't know. Oh, she looked like Claire Foy, but she wasn't. <laughs> no. she looked like her. Okay. 
Um, can, can I just say that again? Going back to the Hogwarts scenes and Fantastic Beasts, like those were great, um, mm. and uh, mainly because the lighting was actually well done, and we could see what was going yeah. on. Yeah, true. <laughs> uh, and maybe that was just. But then it felt evocative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they, they were really pushing on the nostalgia buttons. Yeah. Um, I, I talked to uh, my other friend Jeremy, who's a huge Harry Potter nerd as well. Um, and we, we all are. We all are. <laughs> all the Jeremy. It's just a prerequisite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but talking about the. The representation of Slytherin, particularly, but also Hufflepuff in the, the new movie, and how, you know, in the students, you see a whole bunch of people in green and yellow robes, and that is not the case in the earlier Harry Potter yeah. movies. It's like, red, 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 Gryffindor, yeah! Yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, and how, you know, um, one of our, basically, heroes is a Slytherin, and, mm. and she's really nice, and everyone's, you know, there isn't that stigma there. Yeah, right. Uh, which is something I think is, is a very conscious decision. Yeah. Uh, and that was cool, and the... Yeah, just the, the overall demeanor, the, the, the characters, the uniforms. Like, oh, I, I remember this stuff. I remember really liking this stuff. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for listening to another episode of Cinema in Context. If you enjoyed our podcast, then please share it with your film-loving friends. You can listen to Cinema in Context through SoundCloud or through Apple Podcasts. You can also follow us on Facebook or subscribe to us on Twitter or YouTube. These are all great places to let us know what you think of this episode or give us suggestions for future films to discuss or compare. Look out for our next episode in a month's time, which will be our wrap-up of 2018. And until then, ka kite anō.